In October of 1954, Kay and I drove out our lane at Old Hemlock and made the 280-mile trip across Pennsylvania on our first visit to Dr. Charles Norris. Fair Hill was a silhouette looming against the skyline, looking like a small castle in late afternoon sunlight. The next morning we drove to Dr. Norris's Pheasant Club, Amwell. North through Bucks County and across the Delaware River into New Jersey. I was guided by Duncan Dunn, the manager, an honor my shooting didn't live up to. Those pheasants were slow but sassy and easy to miss. It was here I discovered that my A.H. Fox didn't fit me after shooting grouse with it for 27 years. On that first trip, we had rough and feathers. And at the end of the afternoon, Feathers found the first pheasant George had shot at and thought he had missed. This was the first time I had seen Dr. Norris at Purdy. Our setters stayed in what were the original stables at Fair Hill. On our second day, I began by following Dr. Norris to observe his rhythm on these pheasants. His mount was smooth and fast with a straight left arm and no dwell. His pointer Nellie may have been plump, but they were an efficient pair, a no-nonsense method of dispatching a wounded bird. Our friendship with Dr. Norris had begun in 1952 and lasted for the final nine years of his life, at first consisting of letters until this shooting visit with him. Hamwell was the most enjoyable preserve I have shot on with birds presented naturally and sportingly in cover that seemed wild. Pheasants weren't planted in front of the gunner but kept stalked in the coverts. At one time I saw half a dozen flown from a truck on a distant hill with the birds scattering wide into the valley. Duncan Dunn knew how to do it. They regularly ran field trials here on the preserve mainly spaniels and retrievers, and some of the birds we shot were leftovers from the previous weekend. On the third morning, we left for home. While Kay was saying goodbye to Dr. Norris and Charm and Nellie, I got some pictures of the Fair Hill Ivy. Some of it now clings to the stone wing at Old Hemlock. Looking back, it was as though we were leaving something precious we might not see again.
In February of 1956, we visited Fairhill for the second time, driving across Pennsylvania on the turnpike. This time, Amwell seemed pleasantly familiar. Kay and I started with roughened shadows, later changing to wild and feathers. I had spent the summer having my old fox custom stocked. On the first trip, I missed half the pheasants. This time, all I had to do was point the gun and the birds seemed to come down. Feathers the ham delivered his bird to my camera. George had to pursue him to accept the retrieve. Our second day turned as warm as Indian summer. The problem was to give each dog enough hunting, which no one thought he had. A member setter was buried near the clubhouse. Ruff brings in a cockbird from a long shot. Love that new gun stock. Watch Ruff hold as a pheasant walks under his nose from the right. His next bird was a pheasant so big he had to lay it down as he delivered. There's Wilder. As we prepared to leave for home after three days shooting, Mary, the downstairs maid, came out to say goodbye to our four setters. Each time we parted from Dr. Norris, there was the uncertain feeling it might be the last. On December 2, 1957, we took the Pennsylvania Turnpike once again, 
for our third visit to Fair Hill. The next morning, Nellie and Charm ready to start to Amwell. I had that priceless confidence in my restocked fox that makes a gun and a man one. There was the raw feel of winter in the air, but roughened shadows were working the big Amwell cover with a sense of experience, and we were thinking birds. In a large sedge field, rough pointed, backed by shadows, a hen fell at my shot. Another one flushed, and dropped well out. Ruff retrieved the second bird. Then returned to the first pheasant and delivered it. We exchanged our brace for feathers. Keyed up, he flushed two pheasants I didn't get shots at, but later I dropped one for him. That night the snow began. It lasted 28 hours, blanketing the east with 14 inches making it impossible to drive to Amwell or to leave for home with the Pennsylvania Turnpike closed. Fairhill was a wonderful place to be snowbound, browsing among the sporting books, walking the grounds with the dogs. The small hemlock we brought to Dr. Norris in 1954. The Norris arms in the library wing. The turnpike was open and we got ready to leave before more winter closed us in. This time it was the upstairs maid who came out to see our dogs. Dr. Norris poses charm. Our last view of lovely Fair Hill 
as always was from the long drive down the hill. Our final shooting at Amwell was in October 1958, and I believe it was our finest. The drive across our endless mountains was stunning. Warm Indian summer made it a gunning idol, and it was Little Dixie's first visit to Fairhill and experience under the gun. Next morning, Nellie and Charm, fatter than ever, eager for the drive. At 80 degrees, it was too hot for the dogs. We started with our blue brace, Shadows and Dixie. Dixie's first pheasant fell in the edge of the lake, where she refused the retrieve. Making fast shots in grouse cover is poor training for long shots at pheasants, and I did some indifferent shooting. At the end of the afternoon, we used 11-year-old rough, solo. He settled me down with a nice point that produced a hen pheasant. I dropped almost without thought, followed by an old-fashioned rough retrieve. Our second day was even hotter and sunnier, and George began with his cockbird and a solid hit. After some poor shooting the first day, I made a straight run on the last ten pheasants of the trip, a soothing experience. Shadows pointing in dense goldenrod. Another cockbird and a proud retrieve. We returned to the cars for lunch and spoke to Charm. After lunch, we changed braces, and Ruff pointed a hen pheasant that feathers retrieved. Big Duncan Dunn on the clubhouse porch in scale with a black bearskin rug. At end of day, we took Dixie and Shadows again. Dixie pointed near me, and a cock pheasant boiled up into the sun, but my luck was holding and it fell centered. Dixie's first kill over her point. The next day we stayed at Fairhill due to the heat 
and set out a white pine from old hemlock beside the hemlock we brought four years earlier. From our guest room windows, we saw wild pheasants on Fair Hill. In spite of the heat, Dr. Norris hunted the last day in felt hat and tie. Some ladies have difficulty with the fat. We started with Dixie braced with feathers to show her about retrieving. He soon had a chance to demonstrate. Rough salvaged an overhead pheasant I thought I missed. Lunch at the station wagon with a lonesome Labrador watching wistfully from his kennel. A high incomer taken in the British manner, somersaulting over my left shoulder. Shadows delivered a very limp bird, the last one of the trip. Dixie, so young and so happy. The return to Fairhill was through Lambertville and across the Delaware to New Hope. Next morning we said goodbye to Nellie and Dr. Norris with his morning pipe. His parting words were, you can leave that nice little Dixie here with me any time. We left Fairhill, looking back with a tug of heart strings.
Kay's movies begin with the late 1953 season. Ruff was past six. There's a point ahead and he has a grouse. It's his retrieve, a big black ruffed cockbird. We opened the 1954 season on the famous Dolly Sods with ruff and feathers and shadows. We soon heard a rough flush from some wild cranberries. This is Canadian flora with blueberries, rhododendron, and red spruce. Back home in one of our wild coverts above the Cheat River, feathers and shadows share a grouse. In November, we hunted one of the tributaries of the Yokogany River in Pennsylvania. Ruff was seven. Shadows was one, and in his first season. Ruff is on point. He made the one retrieve of the day, showing young Shadows how to do it. Nineteen fifty four was one of our big years with five hundred and eighty one flushes on three hundred and three separate grouse. Kay made a nice one two shot on these grouse with her camera. I miss both of them. I shot this large cockbird later that day. Many of the birds that season were yearlings, a sign of a healthy population. The old tram road was mere memory among trees. Two-year-old feathers delivered a bird, this gorgeous red ruff, limping on a sprained wrist. Good-natured Amy Miller. Ruff pointed two grouse in this little draw, one flush from under a hemlock, the other out of the branches over my head. Ruff delivered the first bird to Kay. He had to go through an old wooden fence for the other one in the ravine below.
What might seem an exceptional number of grouse were taken on different days. That's the big Yokogany River Basin. Back then it was full of grouse. The White's Creek country is nearly up and down. Kay negotiated some of the down by sitting and sliding. Here's Wilder honoring one of Ruff's points. The grouse fell. Thanksgiving lunch at an old home site with a tamarack. There seemed to be more snow in the early season in those days. Ruff is pointing on the tram road grade. A lunch fire and hot soup are good for cold hunters. June Cochran's footbridge over Roaring Creek. June at his home back in the hills. The frightening moment on Laurel Run and Flood Stage that I wrote about in the Upland Gunners book. On the last day in 54, a grouse fell in huge boulders near the tram road. I saw Ruff carrying it, but when it was brought out, the bird was in Feather's big mouth, and I could guess what happened. We opened the 1955 season in glorious color. 
using rough and feathers in the Roaring Creek section of the tram road. That day we moved 15 grouse for 21 flushes with one shot. Feathers made the retrieve. We took feathers and shadows into the Blackwater country and hunted the famous 22-mile grade. I was shooting the newly restocked fox and everything seemed right. Shooting in that dense spruce is fast or not at all but we managed to grouse at Feathers Retrieve. That's nice Pennsylvania walnut. Identical red rough cockbirds shot over feathers on the upper tram road. It's insanity to take four setters into the woods for grouse. Some days you do it well. Observe that swing. These two shots came in the first half hour we were out. Peg and Les Crowell and their son Sam at a hunting lunch.
Deep snow on the Amy and Homer road to the tram road. This hen is the only gray phase grouse I've shot in our Alleghenies in 66 seasons. Those are the wonderful briary mountains that almost never let us down. Shadows delivers a grouse in fast time. Ice-covered mountains as we drove toward the Dolly Sods where we closed the 1955 season. A cold sunset and three cold dogs. Nineteen fifty six and another Indian summer, hunting in near eighty degree temperatures. Never can I remember gunning in such an autumn like paintings of New England grouse woods. On October 15th, we hunted one of my old coverts I hadn't visited for 10 years. Ruff was nine, feathers four, and they divided honors on two grouse that day. We moved 14 for 17 flushes. Witch hazel blossoms.
on top of the briaries. Kay and shadows at lunch on the old Clint place. Nineteen fifty seven in the high Stony River country. There were grouse in those huge flats. Ruff found a group of eight, putting young shadows into dementia, leaping at each bird as it got up. We moved twenty two for thirty three flushes, with four shots and no hits, and I criticized shadows. A double point by Ruff and Shadows near the Cranesville Bog. Walking on sphagnum moss in the high mountain bogs is like stepping on cushions. These precious coverts are bits of paradise to the shooting man and his dog, places to go and leave the world behind. Grouse often use a power line right of way, like this bird Feathers is bringing to me. At Old Hemlock, three big cock birds from two days gunning that Shadows thinks belong to him. Ten-year-old rough pointing near an ancient home place, Hydrangea. A double point is the kind of double I like. This one by father and son produced a grouse that pleased shadows as much as rough.
A nice end of day, a nice end of season. January 21, 1958, the day Dixie was born. She meets her 11-year-old father, Ruff. At four weeks, we started weaning. Milky faces on Jeb and Jubal, Dixie and Stonewall. Dixie had eight weeks with Ruff. Stonewall, Dixie and Traveler at 12 weeks. Yard training Dixie at five months. Retrieving. Teaching the hold command. The joy of possession. Birds from Dixie's first woodcock hunt in the Canaan Valley. She had been blooded on pheasants earlier that month at Dr. Norris's club, Amwell. But these are wild birds and she drinks in the scent. Dixie tries her first retrieve on grouse, but Ruff decides she's taking too much time. This grouse had a tussle with a predator and was regrowing its lost tail feathers. Here are examples of a black ruff and a red ruff grouse. The color is repeated in the tail band. 15% of my Allegheny grouse have been red ruffs. Gunning the Bruce covered with Dixie in her first year before it was shot out by late season hunters. A young dog will often retrieve a bird more readily after it has lost its body scent. Back home, Dixie delivers this dead grouse perfectly. After the shot, a blind retrieve on snow with a nice delivery by shadows.
The lonely sunsets flame and die, the giant valleys gulp the night. Robert W. Service had seen it. The Yule Log has been a tradition at Old Hemlock since 1939, starting each Christmas fire with a charred faggot of the preceding year's log. Wild pheasants are rare in the Allegheny Mountains. This cockbird was shot over Dixie and Shadows two days before Christmas, 1958. The large sunflower blossom is Christmas dinner for the birds. Bill Dixon was a strange mountain man who made sculptures out of dead wood. There was more than dead wood magic on the mountain above his place. One day in 1959, we moved 11 grouse on Reservoir Hill across the Blackwater from Davis, where Riley, Warden, always said you'd find them. Dixie made one of her first retrieves, running to me with the bird. Driving off Canaan Mountain into the famous woodcock coverts in the valley, the cock were in. Blackwater weather can be anything from sunny to what we call a canane day, blocking out the mountaintops. Wind-blown spruce pointing east on Dolly Sods, a quick shot in cover, a retrieve by Dixie. We divide the fun and let Ruff retrieve it, too. Dixie was saturated with grouse before she was two years old. Back in home coverts, Dixie is sure the world was made just for her. And it often seemed that it was. A high bird over my left shoulder that almost fell in Feather's mouth. A couple of incompleted shots. Point, bird. Rough and feathers search, and feathers has it. A grouse in the snow. And rough, you beautiful thing, it's like seeing you again. November on Canaan Mountain with Rough and Dixie. 
We moved 36 grouse for 67 flushes in five days, and most of them were in open bracken. Dixie went under an overhanging rock to retrieve this bird. That's the town of Davis in the distance. Ruff retrieved another grouse that had an unusual tail marking. Partway up Briary Mountain, Snow Belt and Dixie, hard to see on snow, brings in a red rough cockbird. We honor 12 year old Ruff by letting him find and retrieve it again. A new season, 1960. Everything about this tiny backcountry store at Bismarck was ancient. The Cosner brothers who kept it the 16-year-old major-domo hound of the place. October on the high stony river coverts. Our first trip of the season to the Canaan Valley and a late afternoon hunt in the gates. I fired four one-ounce loads, and shadows retrieved four cock. Next day, we drove up the appalling road along Blackwater River above Davis through color like flame. We hunted rough and feathers on Yellow Creek, where we'd been told, you find the big yellow grouse. I shot a grouse that wasn't big and wasn't yellow, but it was beautiful. It fell in a pool in Yellow Creek where feathers plunged in after it, but lost it underwater. I saw him peering down, and then he had it. At Camp 70, in the mouth of the Canaan Valley, Shadows started to retrieve a grouse, but laid it down, and Miss Dixie took it from him. Mid-October color in the gates. A, a retrieve by feathers with the woodcock almost hidden in his big mouth. Shadows delivers a hard hit grouse up on Cabin Mountain. Those are mountain ash berries. A view of Blackwater Gorge. A miss on top of Canaan Mountain with grouse drumming all around us.
Shadows makes a retrieve hunting on a bandaged foot. Ruff, who didn't see the delivery, got to find the bird again and do his act. Peg and Les Crowell and Shell were waiting at a Blackwater cabin. We took off for the famous 22-mile grade on Canaan Mountain. Starting our four setters on the plateau, stretching from the crest of Cabin Mountain to the drop-off on Allegheny Front. The one shot came at the far end of our trek, and Feathers got to the bird first, delivering it with a stick caught up in his mouth. We gave Ruff a second hand find and retrieve, a cockbird with jet black ruffs and tail band, a grouse I'll never forget. A Canaan day that changed to snow. An elderly gentleman appreciates spatial handling. A nice delivery by Ruff. A parasitic hippoboscid fly leaves the grouse and goes from my ear. Road work at the Blackwater cabin with Ruff bringing up the rear. I opened the 1961 season with the Little Purdy, which came to me when Dr. Norris died in February. I loved the fox, but the live feel and balance of a London best was an experience for me. We went to the Dolly Sods in October, that land of one-sided spruce. We had lost feathers in March, and Ruff was now 14 and a half. We found a small flight of woodcock. Dixie retrieved one part way, and Shadows finished the performance. The Canaan Valley is full of beaver dams. The wonderful gates. I have never known a cock covered that could top it.
Ruff shows Dixie he can still do it in his 15th season. This big cockbird was in the beach cover on the steep side of Cabin Mountain. A view of Canaan Valley from the top. Back down in the valley with Canaan Mountain to the west. Kay really centered that woodcock. A day in one of our home cupboards high above the cheat with Miss Dixie hunting solo. She brought in a grouse with chestnut ruffs and tail band. Dixie takes it in her stride. Kay's lunchtime fire was a beneficence on a day like this. My two lovely girls. The overhang rock near where Big Sandy flows into the cheat. Another snowy hunt and a grouse for shadows. He always showed his pleasure in each bird. Dixie makes another of her ten grouse retrieves that season. Dixie in her fourth and Ruff in his fifteenth season. With a brace like that, working cover like this, what more can you ask? You can't hit them all. New Year's Day, 1962, starting with Dixie and Ruff in Snow. Dixie found almost immediately a grouse that came over George's head and fell at the shot. Dixie beat Ruff to the retrieve. But Ruff took over and retrieved. Within 50 yards, two more birds went out, and then Ruff pointed a third. Where the trail drops to the wildcat rocks, I found Ruff on point again. The, the bird came at me. I fired as it passed, and Dixie retrieved the last grouse shot over a point by Ruff is 547th productive on grouse. January 5th was Ruff's last day hunting grouse. The retrieve he made on New Year's Day was his 176th grouse he brought to me. April 12th was Ruff's 15th birthday. He 
He carried the mail as usual from our mailbox in the long lane to the house where he delivered it to Kay with his same loyal sense of pride. Ruff lived one month longer, a grand old boy, the source of our old hemlock bloodline.